Well, welcome. Uh, very much uh, uh, excited, actually, to have Ambassador Sarakan here. Uh, uh, he and I got to know each other when he was the Consul General uh, for Mexico at the United Nations. And um, we had to talk. Uh, he insisted on talking privately before this conversation to make certain that uh, the things we discussed privately were not going to be discussed here this evening, since he's, he's now an ambassador and he's very diplomatic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's had a very distinguished career. And I would, I'm not sure we'll have time this evening to go into it, but if you're looking for somebody who uh, understands American politics as, as well as anybody I've ever met, it's probably uh, Arturo. Um, uh, and especially if you have, have, as I do, uh, a belief that uh, US politics are very much connected to the politics of the hemisphere. Um, so uh, we welcome you here. Thank Welcome you, you back, uh, uh, because we also, uh, the ambassador was very helpful uh, when we took a trip down to Cuba uh, half a dozen years or so ago. In fact, uh, two of our trustees that you just met, uh, Michael McGillett and Henry Arnholt, uh, came uh, to the United States from Europe through uh, Cuba uh, in the run-up to the war before uh, uh, we changed our immigration policy as to the allowing European Jews to come in in America. So uh, let me just start uh, talking about it. I, I did this intentionally because uh, I put a map of uh, uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico uh, uh, up because uh, uh, the border has become an issue in the United States. And you, you really, when, when politicians talk about the border, uh, when they talk about immigration in America, uh, it's almost exclusively the border between the United States and Mexico they're talking about. And, um, and I uh, have strongly have the opinion, actually, that the uh, immigration uh, into the United States has been almost an unqualified positive. Uh, so what, what, when you think of the border, when you think of that long uh, border between the United States and Mexico, and you, right now you're looking south, but when you're in Mexico, and looking north, what, what does the border mean to you and what's it likely to mean to other Mexicans? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Thanks for the invitation and thank you for, for joining us for this uh, conversation. The first thing that, that I see when I see this, this border, both the Canadian and U.S. border and the Mexican U.S. border is a huge opportunity. I still remember, I'll, I'll name the sin but not the sinner, when a then sitting Mexican president uh, made his first working trip to Singapore many, many years ago, uh, several decades ago, in fact. And he went to Singapore and he met, the, he met Premier Lee Kuan Yew. And in the usual chit chat that always precedes formal diplomatic conversations, um, Premier Lee Kuan Yew asked this Mexican president, remind me, Mr. President, how many kilometers of a border does the United States share with Mexico? And this Mexican president responded, well, unfortunately, 3,000. And Lee Kuan Yew sort of just scratched his head, looked at him and said, Mr. President, what would Singapore give for one kilometer of a border with the United States? <laughs> Not only is it relevant, because I think today, more than 20 years after that occurred in Singapore, A, I don't think that any self-respecting, serious Mexican politician or public official would dare say that about the border with, with the United States. There's been a fundamental sea change in how Mexicans understand the opportunities, but also the challenges in the relationship. And second, I, I think that as a result of NAFTA, as a result of the growing interconnectedness that we see along the border, um, it, th th this is the driver, or one of the main drivers of the bilateral relationship. And sometimes it's easy to forget that even though security seems to be at the core of the relationship these days, this bilateral relationship is much more than just security. If you look at the border, there's everything from challenges to environmental degradation, to infrastructure, to drugs and thugs, to how we manage undocumented immigrant flows, either from Mexico or from other parts of the world that try and transit through Mexico on their way to the United States. How do we foster greater civic interconnectivity between these two borders? It's easy to forget, but on any given day, you have one million legal crossings of people going back and forth this border every day. On any given day, you've got 75,000 trucks of both countries heading into each other's territory. And on any given day, you've got $1 billion of bilateral trade, $1 billion going back and forth every single day of the year. So there's a huge opportunity. 
But does this mean that everything is rosy and peachy? Of course not. There are important challenges, um, not only in terms of, the, of getting policies right, but also of making sure of what you just mentioned, of how we uh, ensure that politics and policies jibe. Because we're living at a moment right now where, unfortunately, the politics have very little to do with the policies. And it happens. It happens in the best of families. We are heading into the silly season uh, in November. Our two countries will head into, as we do every 12 years, our two presidential electoral cycles coincide. In 2012, we will have a presidential election in Mexico in July. You will have a presidential election in the United States in November. And it will be a challenge to ensure that the flatulence that usually accompanies <laughs> electoral processes does not contaminate this bilateral relationship that we're building. You'd be a great candidate. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get me into trouble with that. I'm gonna get you, I'm a, I won't get you in trouble. Well, I mean, it, it's tempting to go down the road that you suggested when you said uh, you, you, you uh, qualified politician with self-respecting, but I won't uh, go down that uh, road. Uh, just uh, what, what is the current status of the bilateral relationship between the United States and Mexico? There's, I have a presumption that maybe the Arizona immigration law uh, did a lot of damage, perhaps some of the rhetoric that's uh, quite... Uh, at times violent uh, towards Mexico uh, could damage the relationship. Uh, but what is the status of the bilateral relationship we're, today? We're we living in a very um, contradictory moment um, because paradoxically the formal bilateral diplomatic relation between both administrations, between the Calderon administration and the Obama administration has never been as good as it is today. There's a sense of engagement, there's a sense of strategic direction in the relationship that we're building. Um, for the first time in the history of the U.S.-Mexico relationship, there's an administration in Washington that has understood that you can't pigeonhole the different issues of the bilateral relationship, that there has to be a holistic vision for how we deal with the border. That's why we were able to produce a very important, very forward-looking declaration when President Calderon came up for the state visit to Washington in May of this year, which is called the 21st Century Border Declaration, which, which uh, uh, under one umbrella, uh, in a very holistic way, attempts to attack and challenge uh, all the premises and the, the, the traditional way of doing business along that border. But at the same time, if you look at public opinion on both sides of the border, it would seem to suggest that we're living, sort of it's like a Dickensian tale of two cities. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. And the challenge that I think that we have as neighboring countries is, is that we have to use the bully pulpit to convince citizens on both sides of the border that they need to remain co-stateholders to one another and to the security, prosperity, and economic well-being of each nation. It's not a surprise, Bob, that um, the, the Pew, uh, Pew did a survey of global attitudes towards the United States, which it usually conducts once a year, and it uh, does these surveys in, in countries that have a particular weight or relationship with the United States. And of all the countries that it polled, and it did this poll just about two weeks after uh, the governor signed SB 1070 in Arizona, no surprise that one of the countries where public perceptions and positive attitudes towards the United States took the highest, the, the deepest dive, was in Mexico as a result of the impact that SB 1070 has had on public opinion. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a diplomatic risk today. I mean, it's relatively some of this, this uh, uh, you know, extreme minister down in Florida who is threatening to burn Qurans. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively minor incident, but it's, uh, it's seen all over the world. So relatively things that, that 20 years ago, when you first started your career in this space, um, uh, relatively small incidents is, weren't as well known. So, so would you, is it correct to say that a very high fraction of people in Mexico are aware of the, of the Arizona legislation? No, I, th I, think, I think a significant number of Mexicans, they, they may not know the details or they may not be in the weeds of what it means and what's being done and what the decision by the judge implies, but there's certainly a very wide knowledge of a law which, even if it's very simplistically put, w was, uh, was perceived as being racist towards Latinos and Mexicans in particular. And, and that, that's a challenge because one of the 
difficulties that we as diplomats or public officials um, have to solve and have to tackle is that on this very, very important issue of immigration, which is probably the most important issue that our bilateral relationship faces, and probably the most important issue to putting this relationship on a good footing. Um, again, the, the issue of how do we mix and match very divergent perceptions is, is, a, is a huge problem because in the United States, most people react to immigration as an issue of the rule of law. Have people broken uh, the laws of this land to come into the United States without papers? So it's an issue of rule of law. In Mexico, most people understand or react to immigration as an issue of fairness. Are people who are providing for the economic well-being and the growth and the prosperity of America being given a fair deal? And, and until we match these two very different perceptions of the men and women on the streets of Atoka, Oklahoma, and San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas, it's, it's going to be hard to change the narrative of the public debate that is taking place on both sides of the border. Is there an economic trajectory in Mexico that uh, uh, leads you to uh, have hope that at some point out in the future that uh, by itself uh, the economic prosperity of Mexico is going to decrease the flow across the border? Yeah. So, I mean, so, it's already begun with the so, recession. Certainly, the it's both an economic factor and a socio-demographic factor. Uh, me me for Mexico to be able to, to dampen uh, the numbers of Mexicans seeking to come into the United States illegally in search of a better paid job, we have to grow at a much faster rate of growth to be able to anchor those women and men in Mexico. And it's very simple. Our loss is your gain. If we can't hold on to 200 this year, 300, which has been the plateau for the past 10 years, 300,000 women and men who are seeking to cross the border into the United States for a better paid job, Mexico won't be able to grow the rates of growth that it needs to grow to bridge those economic asymmetries and diminish uh, the, the, the factors that propel people to cross the border. But at the same time, something which is not very well known, Me Mexico's demographics are also changing profoundly. So if we were to continue to grow, for example, at the rate of growth that we've been growing this year, despite last year's recession, close to 5%, um, if this was to be sustained over the next decade, for example, along with how our society is starting to age, and in 20, 25 years, we'll look a lot like this country because last year was the year where we had the highest number of new entrants into the Mexican labor force. And from there onwards, it's going to start leveling off and then diminishing. We're becoming an older society too because there's been a very profound impact on policies over the past two decades to diminish birth rates in Mexico. Um, so if you factor in these two processes, a diminishing uh, birth rate, a, a, a demographic that is slowly going to start looking like yours, plus the ability to grow, even if some of the TV and radio pundits were to go down on their knees to the Virgin of Guadalupe Shrine in Mexico to ask for excess labor to come up to Napa Valley, in 20, 25 years, it's not going to be there. I'm so so the, cha the challenge is, what do we do between now and when the demographics in Mexico will change in such a profound way where we won't be able to match willing employees and willing employers? That's such a beautiful sight. Uh, um, you know, to see our, our uh, windbags on their knees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, but, but, you, you and I have also talked about this, and uh, I'm going to pay close attention to the differential between what you say now and what you've told me before um, about the North American Free Trade Agreement. And I voted for it, and uh, I would say on balance it's been positive. But did we miss an opportunity at that moment to do north-south development, uh, to at least get a conversation going on about a, some kind of a North American identification card that reduced the friction for people who were moving north-south uh, uh, in a legal fashion? I, I, I certainly think that we lost an opportunity in three key areas. Labor mobility, which was a no-no for the U.S. A serious discussion on energy security and access to energy in the North American market, given the importance that Canada and Mexico have on a daily basis for the energy needs and the energy security of the United States, which was a no-no in Mexico because of where Mexico has historically stood on the issues of uh, state control of, of energy assets and resources. And the third one, which was probably too sophisticated at the time for the three countries to engage in, uh, 
which was how do we put in place without building supranational structures like the European Union, but how could we build a system where, like the Europeans with social cohesion funds that were used to pull Spain and Ireland and Portugal and Greece up from the bootstraps when they entered into the then EEC, how could we have used uh, funds for investment, development, sustainable economic development in Mexico that would have helped to bridge those economic asymmetries that persist today? Still possible? Theoretically, it's still possible. I don't see the political <laughs> appetite in the United States or in Canada for that discussion anytime soon. What do you see when you look south into Latin America? Well, the, first, the first thing that I would probably try and suggest is that we, we, we need all of us, I think, to do a better job of debunking some of the myths and the stereotypes of what, what is and what isn't going on in Latin America today. And I, I think that even though it could sell newspapers and magazines, it does not reflect reality. And what you have in Latin America is not a challenge, is not a battle between the left and the right. Um, it's not an ideological battle per se. I think the battle that is being fought ideologically in Latin America today and within some nations is whether liberal democracy can still deliver the goods. And uh, remember that democracy is about who votes and who gets elected, but the liberal component of liberal democracy is the checks and balances on who gets elected. Right. And what is being corroded in some parts of Latin America today is precisely the liberal component of a liberal democracy. That is the checks and balances on who gets elected and how he or she um, exercises power. And at the end of the day, I think what's really at stake is whether we can continue to convince our citizens from the most humble shoe shiner in the Socal of Mexico City to the most important tycoon, that open and free trade and de democracy and respect for human rights and accountability and transparency can deliver the goods for everyone in our society. And if we can't win that battle, we, we will see much more of a corrosion, of an erosion of some of these um, uh, uh, counterbalancing uh, institutional ar arrangements that have been so important in the past decade in Latin America and which have fundamentally changed the landscape, if, you, if some of you saw The Economist's um, uh, front, uh, car it wasn't a cartoon, it was a, it was a map uh, two weeks ago, um, it, it, was a very, it was a very telling map because it had the, the, the Western Hemisphere on its head, that is Latin America was, uh, was on top and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the northern part was the other way around. And, and, and what the magazine was obviously trying to point to is that there, have, there has been a significant shift in the ability of Latin America to deliver greater uh, uh, social justice, greater economic uh, uh, growth, and increasingly greater democratic institutions. And so th this is what I see when I look south and see some of the challenges, whether because organized crime is corroding institutions or whether because there are decisions being made by politicians and political parties that are corroding these uh, these tenets. Let me talk, sort of talk a little bit. Uh, again, I'm going to test your, your uh, see what kind of differential. There's no differential between uh, what you said to me privately and what you just said about NAFTA. But uh, talk about U.S. drug policy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, imagine uh, the United States of America at the federal level saying we're going to tax and regulate uh, marijuana. Uh, what's the impact on Mexico if that were, if that were to occur? And what's, uh, if I doubled down on that, uh, the other one that I added was uh, a, a, a very uh, important uh, citizen of New York, Joe Flom, once told me that if you took the $100 bill off the market, that that would ha also have a big impact. Uh, it took it off the market for two or three years. Yeah. But the first one is the most, more, much more controversial. Uh, what would be the impact in Mexico? I always say that um, politicians and or diplomats and flies have one thing in common. And that is that we can both get killed by a newspaper. And given that this is a public <laughs> discussion, I, I will tiptoe around this one as carefully that's, as that's I can. Actually, that's quite good. I, I, look, and I, I, I said this the last time I was asked about this issue publicly and, and meet the press. Um, for someone of my generation, um, there should be no taboo subjects. Let's have a serious debate. There will be very strong arguments in favor of um, legalizing marijuana. There will be very serious and strong arguments against legalizing marijuana, but what I do think is that we should have a debate right. 
in the context of what is going on today and not of debates that were hashed out 10, 15, 20 years ago, with have, which have very little bearing on the reality of how organized crime is operating today and the societal impact that that is having. Um, the issue of money laundering, that there, is probably, there are probably two fundamental triggers for the way organized crime is operating in Mexico as we seek to defang them of their ability to push back against the state. The first one is their access to cash, and their, the second one is their access to guns. In this regard, I, I, th I think that we, we have to, um, as we've become increasingly good and efficient, the, U U the US and Mexico, in preventing the formal laundering of money through the banking system, what experts called smurfing, and I imagine they call it because of the little cartoons that there, there were these little blue men that I imagine because um, they probably go unnoticed back and forth. That's, that's why they coined this term of smurfing. But we've been very good at eliminating uh, or restricting formal money laundering through the banking system. But what has happened as a result of that is now that we have approximately $8 billion in cash that every year cross the border from, Me from the United States into Mexico to go back into the hands of the drug syndicates. So all the tools that we can put to our use to enhance our ability to determine eight laundry, billion annual. eight billion annually of bulk cash. That is squeaky clean dollar bills that are crossing the US border into Mexico every year. And it is these eight billion plus the guns that provide the drug syndicates with the ability to bribe and kill and corrupt. How many gun shops on the US side of the US Mexico border? Uh, on the Texas and Arizona border with Mexico alone, 7,000 7, federal firearms licensees, that is gun shops, plus the roving shows. gun shows. And given that you've headed into dire straits on this one, and given that, as you can imagine, the Mexican government, and in, in particular, I am not the flavor of the month of the NRA these days because of how we have been underscoring the importance of uh, illicit guns going into Mexico, I'll be very clear, the Mexican government in no way whatsoever is seeking to undermine the Second Amendment, regardless of whether I think if it's a good idea to be able to purchase armor-piercing ammo to hunt deer or not. We are not about to challenge the Second Amendment. That's a sovereign decision of the American people and of the American Congress. But I am convinced also that the Founding Fathers did not draft the Second Amendment to A, allow international organized crime to illicitly buy weapons in the US, B, to illicitly cross them over international border, and C, to sell them to citizens of a country where those types of weapons or calibers of weapons are prohibited. So what we are asking of the administration and of Congress is help us enforce what's in the books. Help us to stem the flow of guns that is coming from these 7,000 gun shops close to the border into Mexico and providing the firepower of the drug syndicates. So you are, it's interesting, at that, on that moment, at that moment, you agree with the NRA. Just enforce current law. We don't need I, any I, new laws. I, I, would, I would certainly like to see the reenactment of the assault weapons ban because we have seen a direct correlation between the expiration of the assault weapons ban really? and the increase of seizures of semi-assault and assault weapons in Mexico. But I'm not dumb, and I've worked in this country <laughs> for many years, and I know that this will be a very complex political issue. So what we are saying is, given that we know that the politics of the land will probably prevent this from happening, at least help us ensure that the enforcement of what's already in the books occurs. I say really because that, I also, also voted for that. Uh, and I was always at, at a much easier time making the case on Brady uh, that it had a positive impact. But assault rifle, as you, I'm sure you know, banned features, not the actual weapon. Yeah. And it was a much harder case. I've never actually been able to make the case until now, and it doesn't do me any good now. <laughs> so, so it actually, it, you've seen an increased number there's since... A there's a direct correlation between 2004, when the ban expired, and the number of semi-assault uh, assault weapons, semi-assault weapons that we have been seizing in Mexico. So when you hear, um, um, well, I just, when you hear Senator McCain say that the immigration issues has, has produced a real serious security issue in Arizona. Uh, I mean, I'll just I'll, 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 I'll say that doesn't appear to be, doesn't appear the facts back up that, that statement. And it leads me to wonder, 
you know, earlier when you said on the, on the question of legalizing taxing and, and regulating. I mean, I, I suffer uh, for many reasons. One is I, I, I actually have a degree in pharmacy. So um, I can say that we, we tax and regulate cocaine in the United States. Um, very difficult to get a prescrip prescription for, but it's, we tax and regulate it. Uh, but to have a rational debate about that, where facts alone can be brought into the argument, um, seems to be to be naive. And you're not naive. Or maybe you are naive, I don't know. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I do think that uh, this, this, this debate has to, be, uh, has to be had. There's no other way. Um, but again, you know, the, the issue is look, look, at, look at the numbers and look at the data. Right. And if I, I'm not the spokesperson for DHS, um, but if you look at the data on the border, on the U.S. side of the border, despite the spike that we have seen uh, in drug-related violence on the Mexican side of the border, the U.S. border today has never been as safe as, as it is today. The, um, the index of the safest, largest cities in the United States have four of the border cities, San Diego, El Paso, Phoenix, and San Antonio. And along the border, you have the lowest crime uh, indexes in the last 20 years. So this whole drum beating of spillover is quite unfortunate because uh, it does not provide the American people with a proper sense and understanding of what the real challenges on that border are. But again, I mean, it's, it, it, I, mean I, I actually knew what the number was um, uh, of, of gun shops uh, on the U.S. side of the border, and it's, it's disgraceful. Um, I mean, it's, you can't, as an American citizen, feel anything and looking at the facts and knowing that that uh, that produces, uh, you know, not only unsafe conditions but dead people on the Mexican side of the border, it's disgraceful. It, 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 you can't you can't make a case to allow it to go on, but it's going to go on. I mean, I can't imagine unless you come up here and run for president, I can't imagine that political debate being altered by facts. And it gets that's why I was asking about what do you see when you look south. Because I, my own fear about demo, liberal democracy is connected to uh, a the decline of the importance of facts in the political debate, and uh, b uh, the, the 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 fear that tends to be out there for people to actually uh, tell the truth. And I would say c uh, uh, the declining number of people that see a correlation uh, between political activity and their lives, uh, and, and and the moment that comes under fifty percent. Yeah. Um, uh, things are going to change in a hurry. So. Oh, I, I, I completely agree, and this, this is why I think one of the most pressing challenges we as a generation face is that uh, when uh, polls lead policies instead of policies leading polls, we're in, we're in trouble, especially in this bilateral relationship, because this bilateral yeah. relationship is, is unique. There are probably two countries on the face of the earth that have a truly and I, I know that my British friends won't mind me saying this because they will understand what I'm getting at, that have a truly special relationship with the United States. And why do I say this? Because these two countries have one thing in common, which is the convergence of, of domestic and foreign policy into one big parcel where you need to push foreign policy. You need to take, take on the Gordian knots of domestic constituencies and domestic issues. And those two countries are Israel and, and Mexico for very different reasons. But increasingly, uh, Mexico and the United States, the domestic policy of one is foreign policy for the other, and vice versa. And if we're to move any issue that we have out there, whether it's trucks and the access of Mexican trucks after 15 years of noncompliance from the United States to provide access to Mexican trucks to American roads, whether it's the issue of how do we take on immigration reform on both sides of the border, how do we take on organized crime, how do we create a better understanding of the future that North America has and how we take on new global competitors. All of these issues, every single one of them, goes through Congress, goes through a, through a state assembly, goes through a governor's mansion. Th this is the reality of what Bayless Manning uh, wrote in a, uh, I was going to say famous, but I don't know how, how famous it was at the time, but in a, in a foreign affairs essay in which he wrote in the 70s in which he coined the intermestic nature of, of some of the relationships that the United States has on the face of the earth. And if there's an interdomestic relationship the United States has on the face of the earth, it's precisely with Mexico because of the convergence of domestic and foreign policy. We're talking a little bit about immigration. I'm going to try to get this little television. Can I make it work from up here? 
Okay, so this this is a uh, what a kind of show I'm going to try to show, or somebody's going to try to show a piece that was in the New York Times. Can you pull? There we go. All right, this is a this is a New York Times map, and this what year are we in? I can't see it. 1890. Okay, so you're in 2000, but take it all the way back to 1890. Red is is Hispanic. Uh, purple is, I think, green is Canada. Western Europe is purple. Asia, Middle East is orange. Latin America is uh, various shades of red. Uh, Russia is dark blue. Africa is uh, sort of a purple. I don't know. What, I'm, maybe I'm colorblind here all of a sudden, but kind of a magenta. All right, so this is um, 1890. Why? Why? What? What happened? I didn't want Indiana. Want they're, they're focusing on the northern border now. No, I want to look at Mexico. Why? Why? I, mean, I understand red today, but why so much red in Texas in 1890? Well, because uh, for, <laughs> ma for many of those, for many of those communities, they, they did not cross the border. The border crossed there <laughs> um, after the Mexican-American War. So, so you have a very important concentration of of Mexican and uh, Hispanic communities. Uh, especially Texas, but also you see that you see it in, you should be seeing it in, in New Mexico, Mexico Arizona, right. and, and California. Did you just make that up? The border across them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so follow this. Not just kind of go with a I don't know five second interlude in, or ten seconds. This is this is 1900. 1890. Go to 1900. Just take it across slowly. Well, there you go. All right, so not it, a little faster than that. All right, so the Canadians are coming down for a while. Keep going. You just admitted Arizona Right, they just came into the. They just they just made it in the in the in the. What, what, right. what, one of the factors that explains this, especially around the 30s and 40s, especially in the in the, in the 40s, was the Bracero program when the US government invited Mexican workers into the United States because the United States was fighting two wars in the Pacific and, the, and in Europe. And a lot of the labor that was needed, especially for, for uh, agriculture, came through the Bracero program in, in Mexico. Take, take, take it back. And we'll, we'll, let's get a little comment going here, because that was a very interesting comment by itself. But just take it back to, to, to 1940 then again. OK. All right. So take it, take it to, you, did you see something else? No, the, the, precisely the. The concentration you start getting by Imperial, um, you should see a bit more of that in, in Southern California, but maybe take that's it, mid mid forties. Well, the the valley's covered. There, yeah. So t take it to fifty. I'm gonna let you comment as you see this coming across. Well, this is useless. What is that? Go, take it to sixty. This, that looked like eighteen sixty. That one. Um, all right, so keep going now, because it, it starts to accelerate. You, you can, you, go to, it's actually very, right? Cuban Revolution. All right, 90, 2000. Right, so here's, here's the, what, what, what do you see when you see this map? First of all, a profound economic reality that a, a need for labor is being met by workers across the border, for starters. And the, the decade of the 90s, with the very high growth, we saw it in this city. Um, when I was consul general here, uh, I arrived in 2003. And um, New York City had not traditionally been a city of Mexican migrants. It was Puerto Rican, Dominicans. Um, but in the 10 years previous to 2003, 2004, we saw a huge upsurge in, in Mexican migrants coming into New York City, which was propelled both by the construction boom and by the, the, the services, the expansion of restaurants, hotels, etc. A lot of what you've seen since then is the arrival of new Mexican communities into areas that had not traditionally been areas of, 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 uh, of migrant attraction. All right, so take, uh, when I look at it, when I first looked at it, I saw the meatpacking industry in Nebraska. Yeah. Right? You're, you're and I, seeing, I know those communities. You're seeing a lot in the, in the Carolinas, right. and in Georgia, Colorado. These are some of the new areas where you've seen a very important increase in, 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 in immigration from Latin America. So beyond the economic, what else do you see? I, well, the challenge that we face in, in America today is to being able to have a, 
sensible, objective debate on why this issue is so important. Because A, people need to understand that most of the people that are coming across the border without papers are doing so, not because they want to have a baby and then anchor the family so they can come in. They're coming to seek a better paid job. Second, that if they were given a chance, most of them would not stay in the United States, but would do what they were doing probably until the mid-90s, which was going back and forth, what we call the circularity in the labor movement. Up until the mid-90s. What do I mean by this? That until Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Guardian in California, Baja California, and then post 9-11 security, what used to happen was that a Mexican migrant who was coming for a, a job in the United States would cross the border probably on his first attempt. He wouldn't have to pay a smuggler. He would get across. He would go to Washington State, apple harvest. Then he'd come to Long Island, do some roofing. And then over Christmas or the holidays, he would go back to Mexico. And he would do this every year. There was, a, again, this is what I mean by the circularity and labor movement of people going back and forth. What changed dramatically in the past decade was as a result of heightened enforcement on the border, and it didn't start in 9-11, it, 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 it got kicked off by the construction of the fence first in the Baja California, California border with Operations Gatekeeper and Operations Guardian, and then obviously as a result of 9-11, what started happening is that I'm, if I'm a worker trying to find a job in the United States, A, I'm no longer being able to cross on my first attempt, I'm crossing or on my eighth or ninth attempt. And B, I'm not getting across free. I'm paying anywhere between $3,000 and $5,000 to organize crime that has muscled its way into the mom and pop business of coyotes who would work this border for generations in which they basically would just cross people across over the border and, and, and make sure that they got to where they were going. <laughs> so the incentives, once you're on this side of the border, given that it is so much difficult to go back and forth as it used to, the incentives of going back have completely disappeared. So what has changed is the absolute numbers of Mexicans who aren't going back and who are staying put, and then obviously try and bring in their families. That is what has changed in the past decade. Book, uh, again, I'm going to test your diplomatic uh, uh, tendencies here. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll assert it as a, as a declaratory on my side rather than asking it as a question and just ask you to respond to it. I grew up with the Cold War, right? So it ends in 91. But, you know, uh, almost my first conscious moment, uh, it, you know, we're organizing duck and cover drills and thinking we're going to blow ourselves up. And, you know, your whole adolescent mindset uh, was on the Cold War and the you know, the, the you know, transformed higher education. I mean, it was really quite remarkable, the impact that it had in the United States. And I thought we were out of the woods. And then 10 years later, we have something actually, in many ways, it's worse. We have a war on terror where there's no end. Um, um, when people in Mexico look at the United States and see the greatest, most powerful nation on earth is putting this amount of energy into a perpetual war on terror, uh, they must it seems to me, at least from time to time, scratch your heads and wonder, wonder what's happened to us. Um, um, this, this, is, this is a very important issue, again, because there's no relationship more important to the security and well-being of both countries than the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Again, by virtue of sharing a 3,000-kilometer border and the need, especially after 9-11, to ensure that we're both working together to ensure that neither potential terrorists or transnational organized crime use this border to, uh, to undermine the security of both countries. My, my concern is someone who has... Uh, but excuse me, isn't it mostly a... I mean, I uh, was on the 9-11 Commission, as you know. I mean, the, the thing yes. that, that was, was most concerning was not necessarily the, the, the actual existential threat, but the damage that it would do to the U.S.-Mexican relationship if yep. uh, you know, somebody comes across the border and then carries out uh, one-off act of terror. That, that is precisely the challenge. And that's why, again, to the naysayers out there who would suggest that Mexico is not a stakeholder to U.S. security on, on the southern border, look, if, if anything were to happen or a threat were to materialize in the United States because it crossed that border, the relationship that a generation of Mexicans including myself, have been attempting to build with the United States goes down the drain. Right. So it behooves Mexico to work hand in hand with the United States to ensure that the border is secure. But now if you look at it from 35,000 feet, 
the, the, the challenge that we see is that um, nine years of a struggle against transnational <laughs> terrorism, however important it is for us to wage it and to win it, has also changed the focus of how American grand strategy understands the role of US foreign policy. And one of the areas that has been affected by this, obviously, is the hemisphere because we've seen, and it's natural, I would, not, I would never sort of challenge the reasons why the focus and the span of attention of the United States moved to where it moved in the Middle East and uh, a Central Asia the Persian Gulf. But the fact is that um, th there has been a significant disengagement of the United States conceptually regarding how it works together with Latin America, a region that has not had a single major war, uh, an interstate conflict in, in decades, and how it builds a, a, an area of prosperity, of growth, that will add to the security of the United States and to all those nations in the hemisphere. But that actually began in 91, though. When, once the Cold War was over, uh, yeah. and, and, except, there, there for, no, except for Cuba, we didn't really have much of an interest in the uh, hemisphere. As, as, a, as a, both a historian and an um, international relations student, um, I, I'm convinced that despite the 1066s and the 1941s of the world, there are no magical dates. And so it would be very, I think, um, simplistic to say that, you know, 9-11 is what changed this. It started happening, I, I agree, be, be, before that when, and that's one of, you were there, one of the triggers uh, for Mexico to approach the United States and discuss a free trade agreement with North America was the understanding that um, after what had happened in Berlin and in the, in the heart of Europe, Europe was going to become uh, much more self-involved and that if the nations of North America didn't start designing a new paradigm for, us, for ourselves, we were going to face a huge challenge. I, I still remember President Carlos Salinas, who had just gone to Davos um, in January of 1990, coming back from the plane convinced that what he had seen in Europe as a result of the end of the Cold War compelled him to completely change the paradigm of how Mexico had engaged with the United States. And that's what triggered the, the debate with the Bush administration and which was then carried by the Clinton administration in ensuring that we got NAFTA and, and that this, for the first time in the history of North America, changed the way that Canada, Mexico, and the United States understood one another and understood the opportunities that we could, we could trigger by working together. And it, it, to be clear, it's, it's still a contentious issue. It was. It is. Uh, I mean, President Obama, when he was a candidate, practically he had to promise to go back and take another look at NAFTA to get across the line. So uh, well, I, mean, I presume that President Calderon is doing a lot more than practically the only thing that we uh, uh, pay attention to up here, which is uh, his uh, fight against the, the drug cartels. What, what is the uh, Calderon agenda? What, what, what other things well, are going the, on in Mexico besides the, the, that? The first one that I, th I, th I think is very important that we underscore is that despite the, the drugs and thugs narrative, the, if it bleeds, it leads dynamic in, 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 in the U.S. press as it relates to Mexico. What is happening in Mexico is not related specifically to drugs or drug trafficking. President Calderon decided to unleash an all-frontal attack on organized crime because organized crime today is the most is the most important threat to the rule of law and the empire of liberty in Mexico it has to do with drugs but it's much more than just drugs it's a real challenge to the rule of law so one of the most important reforms that the president submitted to congress was a judicial reform which is moving a Mex Mexico away from the napoleonic type of uh, uh, justice system to a system like the United States, an accusatorial oral trial system, which will take time to, to bleed down, to, to trickle down into the state and local level, but when completed could have one of the most significant impacts on the rule of law, on how justice is, 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 uh, is provided for in Mexico. Um, and, and this is a critically important issue, how Mexico is for the first time develop, developing uh, niche sectors that are becoming the tractors of our economic growth, aerospace and IT. I, I bet that if I were to ask anyone in this room, would you traditionally think of Mexico as the most important aerospace hub, the, the most important growing aerospace hub in the world today? I sh I'm sure that I would get no nods from mostly everyone in the room. Today, Mexico uh, 
is the country that is receiving the highest foreign direct investment in aerospace. Why? Because we have converted Querétaro, the central part of Mexico, into a hub and spoke system, which is not only enticing foreign direct investment, but more importantly, creating community colleges that are tied into the uh, into, into, these, into this investment. It, it is creating small and medium-sized Mexican firms that are feeding into, into the system. It, it's completely changing the way Mexico can position itself um, in, in, in a global economy. And we're doing it in two very important areas. IT, especially in the Mexicali and then the Guadalajara, Jalisco corridors, and then aerospace in the central part of Mexico, Querétaro, uh, uh, Guanajuato, so, so the, the, these are very important drivers of, of an effort to provide sustained long-term growth that, among other things, would have a very important impact on the bilateral relationship because, again, if we can anchor these women and men in Mexico with better paid jobs, that will diminish the incentives for, pe for people, bold, entrepreneurial, crossing the border in search of a better paid job in the United States. And is, uh, uh, is Mexico investing in research universities as well, trying to build that research capability? Yeah. Where? where, where? The, the most important research, the, tra the most important traditional research hub is the National University of Mexico, which, by the way, was just celebrating its 100th uh, anniversary as, as the university it is today. It, it is actually uh, uh, the oldest university in the Americas. It was founded by, by colonial Spain. But in its, in its inception as a national university, it has just celebrated its 100th anniversary. Was your father president of that university? Yes, he was, yeah, for eight years. So that, that has been traditionally the, the hub of uh, scientific research. But now you have many other institutions in Mexico, in Monterrey, in Guadalajara, in, again in León, Querétaro, in Mexico City, that are uh, changing the way um, research is being plugged into uh, the, the, the profile of small and medium businesses growing in, in, in Mexico. And is it recognized, do you think, by the people that that's uh, a good initiative? Uh, I, I think it is. The, the, the challenge we obviously face is that we still have very important reforms, as this country has, in terms of uh, education, ensuring that education is much better uh, delivered, that we have standardized tests, that we can uh, eliminate some of the challenges that we face um, in, in terms of the uh, role that some of the unions play in, in, in regards to education in Mexico. Um, but but I, I, I think that we have today in Mexico the most highly qualified, best trained young Mexican generation that the country has ever seen in its history. And by the way, uh, in addition to seeing uh, the economic issues that are obvious in this map, I, mean, I looked at that map and I see tremendous uh, value added in culture, music, um, uh, food, language, fashion. I mean, it's, there's, there's an alteration that, that occurs uh, anytime you come into contact with somebody who has a different culture than yours. And for the most part, it starts off a little threatening and then that's, uh, ends up being quite good. This, this, this school is uniquely positioned at the fulcrum of this because Me Mexico may certainly not be a, a uh, military power, but it is a cultural superpower. And this, this city for generations, in, in its interaction with Mexicans who were here, with Orozco who painted the mural, with so many Mexicans that came to New York City and so many Americans that went down to Mexico, um, th th this has shaped the way our two countries interact. And, and one, of the, one of the instruments in Mexico's diplomatic toolbox that I think allows Mexico to punch above its weight in the international arena is precisely its cultural diplomacy and, and how culture is bringing our two countries together, how culture is redefining this border. If you go to the border region, both on the US side and on the Mexican side, culture is completely redefining two border communities and tying them together. So th this is one of the most fascinating drivers of our relationship. And you, you mentioned sort of sometimes how people or communities or universities or uh, creators sometimes feel threatened. Um, when we were negotiating NAFTA, I still remember that there were many in Mexico who for example, we're saying, oh, we're going to get gobbled up by McDonald's and Burger King and uh, the Mexican traditions of cuisine and gastronomy are going to disappear. Well, um, just look at the number of Mexican restaurants in the United States today. And if that's not enough, this year during Super Bowl was the first year that more guacamole and avocado was sold than ketchup during Super Bowl. Man, you so, are. So <laughs> that, 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 tells you, that tells you a powerful story. You've really, you've got this down. Ha, ha, ha.
let me turn to the audience for uh, questions. We're going to talk till about 7.30. We're actually then going to go have dinner in the Roscoe room. And uh, the ambassador, uh, uh, on his own, initiated contact with the New School when he was the Consul General for Mexico and provided uh, funds to restore the uh, Roscoe murals. And it was a little painful because uh, the founding president of the New School, Alvin Johnson, persuaded Jose Clemente Orozco uh, to uh, put those murals up for, for cost of materials only. Uh, so we've been, I guess, sort of freeloading on Mexico for almost 90 years on those, on those murals. Uh, we have sent, sent some fellows down to Central America to study the effects of, of NAFTA on the agricultural sector, be, sector because although industrial uh, relations have been uh, positive from NAFTA, we found that there's a tremendous amount of new poverty in, uh, in, in Central America, and I think in Mexico to some extent because of the inability of, the, of those countries to, uh, to compete with subsidized foodstuffs from our country. This, this is one of the most vexing issues that we face in terms of understanding both the impact of free trade agreements, and in the case of Central America, it would be CAFTA more than NAFTA, um, but also one that I think that we have to also look at carefully and look at the data. I, I would never disagree with you that there has been a very profound dislocating impact um, in, in the Mexican rural sector as a result of enhanced competition, but I will stay there because I, the challenge in the case of Mexico it, it, is that this competition has been probably more importantly coming from Mexico from, than from the United States, and let me explain why. When Mexico signed NAFTA in 1993, Mexico was producing around 17 million tons of corn per year. Mexico last year produced around 46 million tons of corn per year. So it's not an issue of a diminishing ability to grow and produce corn. It's the policies that have not been put in place by successive Mexican governments in the past to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of higher yield, capital intensive, uh, technologically uh, sophisticated Mexican producers who are squeezing out small and medium sized farmers in Mexico from competing and accessing global markets. On the other hand, one of the most important success stories of NAFTA is precisely in agribusiness. One of the most important spikes of Mexican and U.S. exports to each country is in uh, fresh produce. And there's a very simple and powerful reason. When you produce, we don't, and when, you pr and when we produce, you don't. So our exports have become complementary. And this has provided for very important uh, 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 investment, job creation, but again the challenge is how do you ensure that that trickles down to other parts of Mexican territory where either because of the topography, the socio-political dimensions of local and state governments, or because of uh, communal uh, uses of land, these small and medium-sized farmers have not been able to compete with their Mexican brethren, let alone with other, whether they're U.S. or Canadian or uh, other competing businesses from, from uh, bringing produce in. Now here's an interesting question. This is, I have a nine-year-old son, as you know, and uh, he asked me the same question about Nebraska because he saw a weather channel show on tornadoes. But uh, his, here's the question. I'm sad to say, but I'm, I'm really afraid to visit Mexico. Is this fear justified? And what do each of our countries new, need to do to correct this? Well, if, if the person who asks the question were to tell me exactly where I would probably answer that question <laughs> with greater depth. If you're telling me you're going to go to Ciudad Juarez, I'd probably say don't go. But if you're going to go to any resort, to Mexico City, to any of the colonial towns, it's a saying don't come to New York City because there was a shooting in high school in Colorado. Um, the, the violence in Mexico is focal. It is basically gang on gang related. It is occurring, Mexico has approximately 2,700 municipios, the equivalent to your counties. Um, more than 80% of all drug related deaths are concentrated in 80 of those 2,700 municipios. Does this mean that there isn't an issue of violence? Does this mean that there aren't people getting caught? Of course there are. There are people who are unfortunately in the wrong place at the wrong time and who have been killed as a result of the drug-related violence. 
but the country isn't ablaze from the Rio Grande to the border with Guatemala. Okay, so here's a, 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 a 1848, the United States had a war with Mexico. That's how, that's how it's described in our history books. Uh, what do the Mexican history books call that war? <laughs> it's called the U.S. Invasion. <laughs> <laughs> Is not, it? Ro not rocket science. It's, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's still one of these episodes in our history which recurringly comes up. But, but I, th I think, look, uh, again, and this is why I started by mentioning, uh, by, by sharing with you this anecdote of this Mexican president, because I, I think there has been a very important shift in the way Mexicans understand the relationship with the United States. They may like it or they may not like it, but the reality is that most of them have a cousin, a son, a daughter, a friend who lives in the United States. And the way this social dynamic is changing the way both countries understand and interact with one another is changing perceptions on the street as to the importance of this bilateral relationship. So yes, you still you open a Mexican textbook uh, in, in a public school and it'll say la invasión estadounidense a México. But, but I, I look, if, if, um, if Germany and France could uh, take on the traumas of the 1817, the Great War, and the Second World War, and develop the kind of partnership uh, of relationship that they have today, uh, I think Mexico and the United States could do no less than that. A question here to ask you to provide a little more detail on how judicial reform helps uh, fight the war against organized crime in Mexico. Well, certainly it, it enhances the strength of, ju of the judiciary. Uh, one of the very important achievements of Plan Colombia, and one of the reasons why, if you look at Plan Colombia from the perspective of the rule of law, has been such, a, such an important success is because it, it has enhanced judiciary, the strength of the judiciary in that country. And, and look, given that uh, furry mammals and lipstick were so in vogue in, in the presidential campaign in the United States, <laughs> a year and a half ago, this is one pig that I'm not going to put lipstick on. Corruption <laughs> it is an endemic challenge in Mexico. We have to take it on. And this reform that was presented by Congress and, by, and supported by parties of all colors and stripes in the Mexican Congress will, over the long term, enhance the ability of the judiciary to um, eliminate corruption, to ensure that not only those who can pay and that have the means to do so can get justice, but the justice serves everyone across the board. And th this is a very important driver, not only in the fight against organized crime, but in the ability of Mexico to continue down a path of modernization and of the fuller and more inclusive democracy that we've been building for a couple of decades now. Here's, here's a, 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 an interesting question. Uh, presumably, the United States uh, continues to consume drugs, and that doesn't decrease, and that we don't legalize uh, marijuana tax and legalize. And I uh, presume that we're, we're uh, at the margin not going to do an awful lot more to help, uh, I mean, uh, 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 with Mexico's uh, drug war. Uh, and I was unaware of this. Maybe it, uh, it, there's a, in some circles, this question says there's a quid pro quo being discussed. Uh, Mexican government stops the war against drugs and allows commerce and drugs by drug gangs. And the quo is drug gangs stop their attacks on government and press personnel. I mean, there's a high-profile newspaper that published a, a, an appeal yeah. that... No, there, there's, there's certainly been a, a discussion uh, by some, and some of them well-respected pundits that should know better, uh, suggesting that the status quo ante was better because we sort of safely ignored the drug syndicates and they would go about their business and they would not unleash attacks against uh, the state. Uh, the problem is that what they're missing here is that... Uh, the corrosion that, that had occurred in Mexico over the past decade was so pervasive that it was no longer just an issue of getting drugs across the border. It was becoming a huge cha challenge to the vitality and the dem democratic strength of the country. Um, whoever thinks that, this, uh, that there's a shake-and-bake policy that will allow us to uh, end uh, the challenge of organized crime overnight is, is crazy. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take the continued support of the United States, whether working with Mexico to enhance and exchange intelligence, whether it's by the United States helping us curtail the flow of weapons and, and bulk cash. Um, but, you know, the, the, as Margaret Thatcher would say, there, there are no U-turns. She didn't actually say it this way, but there, there, 
there can and there should be no U-turns. Now, does this mean, does this mean that you don't fine-tune the strategy and that you don't ensure that you're, you're... I've always believed that in the fight against organized crime, we have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to chew gum, whistle, speak on the Blackberry, and walk at the same time. And you have to push back. You have to extradite. You have to eradicate. You have to seize. But at the same time, you've got to create socioeconomic incentives so that young people in the streets of Ciudad Juarez are not being brought in by the drug gangs to create a domestic market because they're not being able to cross the produce over into the United States because of enhanced interdiction by both governments. But you, 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 you began, or one of your first significant uh, uh, postings had you involved with counter-narcotics. And just to extend the transportation metaphor uh, apparently used once by Margaret Thatcher, uh, one of the problems I've got with this, it feels more like a cul-de-sac. I mean, it feels like we're going around and around, like nothing really is changing uh, other than we're spending more and more money on uh, a war. Um, the, the, I would agree if your definition of success is there's no drug trafficking and no drug consumption. That's not my definition of success. So it, it, the challenge is how do we change the narrative? You have to understand that the demand for drugs... And has the narrative changed? Is, 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 is completely inelastic. Has I it, think the narrative is starting to change. Since when you first began in counter-narcotics? Certainly. Over these changed. many years? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that increasingly people understand that what we may have been seeing in the past two decades is old wine and new bottles and that we have to change the paradigm, that we have to look at ways in how we build the resilience, how we do harm reduction, uh, harm mitigation, and knowing that what we need to do in Mexico is basically a three-pronged approach. A, we bring down the number of violent deaths. The second one is, contrary to what I would be doing, if I was in California speaking to Google, enticing them to come to Mexico to do more business, where I would be lowering the opportunity cost of doing business in Mexico, with the drug trade, what you're doing is raising the opportunity cost of doing business in Mexico. You're making it so much expensive, so much more expensive for them to do their, conduct their business in Mexico that they pack up and go, go somewhere else. Much like what you did in Florida and in Miami in the 70s when you shut down the Florida panhandle is a conduit of drugs, cocaine, coming into the U.S. market, and it shifted to the point of least resistance, which is Mexico and Central America. So in many ways, what I'm saying is I want them to pack up and go somewhere else. Now, the challenge is that is why the United States and Mexico and Colombia need to develop a truly regional approach, because if not, our success will mean the huge, huge headache for countries in Central America and in the Caribbean, and it's already happening. And the third, the third benchmark for success is that we move drug trafficking in Mexico from being a national security challenge, which it is today, to an issue of law and order and public security, which it, which it is in the United States today, and how we migrate away from that. But if anyone would suggest that we will eliminate drug consumption and drug production, given the dynamics of the market and the fact that Mexico stands on the doorstep of the largest consumer market of illicit drugs on the face of the earth. You're not the most lucrative, but you are the largest. Um, it's going to be hard to change that dynamic. We're not the most lucrative? No, the most lucrative today are in Western Europe. Wow. It's nice, not, it's nice to have one thing you don't <laughs> object to not being first in. Uh, how, are, are you making more progress than we are on income and wealth uh, inequality? It's, it, the cha Latin America has seen a very important change in uh, the distribution of, of wealth, but still Latin America, it is not the poorest region in the world, but it is the most unequal region in the world. However, we have seen in the last decade a slow shift, which is one of the issues that, for me at least, provides a healthy dose of optimism. It's not sexy, it's an unheralded story, but it's a very important story which is that thanks, in the case of Mexico, to a three-pronged approach, sustained, responsible macroeconomic policies in the, since the last devaluation of the peso in 1994 when the U.S. government, under the leadership of President Clinton, very quickly moved in to, to put a financial rescue package which averted a major crisis from blowing up. So sustained macroeconomic policy since 1994. Mexico's access to the global economy via NAFTA after 1993. <laughs> and the creation and huge success of an extreme poverty alleviation program based on 
conditional cash transfers called oportunidades. It's, it's, it's been in, in play for, for now four or five administrations in Mexico under different names, but it's basically the same premise. It's conditional <coughs> cash transfers to the female head of household, conditional on two things occurring. The kids go to school with passing grades. B, she and the kids go to their, get their vaccines and their, and their, uh, their uh, visits to the doctor on time. This has been, along with Bolsa Familia in Brazil, uh, two programs that have completely changed what uh, Mexican society looks like today and has recreated for the first time since the early 70s when the Mexican middle classes were obliterated by the recurring cycle of boom, devaluation, uh, administration changes. It has started recreating a Mexican middle class which had basically disappeared. And this, I think, is one of the most encouraging trends that we see in Latin America and particularly in Mexico, <coughs> Brazil, and Peru, and Chile, uh, though Chile is, is probably a much more egalitarian society than any of the others that I've mentioned. You, you, you just, I note that you very much like me when you're trying to make a, a point that has multiple parts, that you try to go with three, because in my case, if I do four, by the time I get to the fourth, I forgot what or, the first or, one was. So. Or you say four and you do this. Right. So you, you know, sticking with a question connect, connected to the Trinity, what's the, what's, what's the role of the church uh, in Mexico? And has that changed over the last 20 or 25 years? Well, Mexico is still constitutionally a secular republic with a very strict separation of state and, and church, which, which I think is, is the way republics should be and should operate. Um, but I, I think there's also been a, a process of, of modernization in the relationship between churches and the state. I think there's a much more mature, much more normal exchange and inter, in, 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 uh, interaction between churches of different persuasions in Mexico and the body politic. Um, uh, but, but certainly I, I would continue to underscore how important, because of Mexico's past, the strict separation between church and state is for, for a country like mine and something that I profoundly believe in. Are you uh, optimistic that uh, the United States Congress and the President will sign comprehensive immigration reform sometime before you and I are confined to wheelchairs? If that's the horizon, yes, I am optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but not... It's, it's not going to happen anytime soon, not with an economy that is still in the doldrums, uh, with all the pain that this has triggered, with how divisive the issue has become in America today, um, how polarizing the debate is. I, I, I would love to see some forward move and traction, but I don't think the, the politics of the land will allow us to see anything in, in the short run. Is it, is it, I mean, there's, there is a, in, in the United States, as I'm sure you know, because you're a great student of the United States, um, there's this Nixon goes China expression to, that applies to uh, the situation where sometimes it's easier for a Democrat to do something that is a Republican and vice versa. Is this going to be an easier issue for a president uh, who's a Republican to deal with than a Democrat? Well, that, that, that was sort of the, the wisdom of the land with the Bush administration, and, and I think there was a very important opportunity for President Bush, who profoundly believed in, in comprehensive immigration reform, in part because as a governor of, of Texas, he had firsthand knowledge and understanding of the dynamics on the border. But he, he couldn't deliver his party, and his party didn't support him uh, throughout his administration. So this may be one issue which may not fit nicely into the Nixon goes to China paradigm mm. of a president from, in this case, on this issue, a Republican president delivering immigration reform. Yeah, in fact, it's... it's I, I think it's, it's going to be clearly an issue where there's going to have to be a, par a bipartisan compromise solution. And there's a diminishing number of those, you may have noticed. <laughs> but the, it's interesting to me, actually, when you, when, you, when you make that point, and I agree with it, because uh, what's oftentimes missed is that the Tea Party movement began as a movement against uh, Republican incumbents and immigration's on their list. Um, too soft on immigration, uh, which is probably why Senator McCain tried to move so far <laughs> far to the right that he couldn't see anybody in the middle anymore. But it's a, it's a yeah, I think you're right. I think this was not one where uh, uh, you should uh, acquire hope that a Republican's gonna be able to fix it. I think it, today it's actually harder for a Republican to fix it than as a Democrat. It, it would probably be easy for me to sort of finger point on this, which I won't do because 
You're a diplomat. If, if, if I, well, <laughs> even, more, even more specific than that, if I was a, the ambassador of a Central European country with the Atlantic in the middle, I probably could give myself the privilege of um, not being an equal opportunity cheerleader, but as a Mexican ambassador, I have to be an equal opportunity cheerleader. The challenge, I think, we all, Americans, Mexicans, Democrats, Republicans, the different political parties in Mexico will face in November is that both the Democrats and the Republicans that come into the House will probably be, for different reasons, um, Less inclined. miles away from supporting an issue which is as toxic and as divisive and as polarizing as immigration reform in the next months. Yeah, that's why my own view is coming, revisiting NAFTA in some significant way to demonstrate both the current benefits of it and the potential benefits if some kind of you know, I would say sort of north-south development scheme along the lines of what the EU did. Although I wouldn't, I wouldn't as you did earlier, you were way ahead on points until you put Greece on the list. So uh, uh, let me move on here. Uh, this is an interesting question. How do you think the high-profile grant of asylum to a Mexican journalist, and perhaps more to come, will impact the discourse and perception of migration flows from Mexico? I, I don't necessarily think it'll have an impact per se. I, I think it has, it has much more of a bearing on the discussion of what is going on in the fight against organized crime in Mexico and how we in Mexico ensure that journalists are protected by doing their job. I, I've always believed that uh, if, if we can't ensure that newspapers and journalists can blow the whistle and can ensure that both government, federal, state, and local is accountable, but also can shed light on what some of these organizations are doing, uh, our democracy will suffer for it. So one of the challenges that we will face in Mexico is how do we bulletproof and how do we protect journalists who are, who are, who are poking holes and in light into places where people ordinarily don't like light to be shed on. This is, this, is a very, this is a long question, but I think it's a really good question. I'm, I'm, so I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm seeking perspective from the average working Mexican family. Uh, that's how it starts. Uh, how present is the U.S. in their day-to-day -day lives? In what ways? What's the view of the influence of U.S. culture, both formal TV, movies, et cetera, and informal attitudes regarding success? Would people want U.S. companies to create local jobs or U.S. support for Mexican entrepreneurs to generate jobs? What's the view of seeking uh, education abroad? Is it supported, seen as a risk, brain drain, that sort of, that sort of thing? Yeah. No, I, I think that, and I've always said that if, if you talk to the men and women on the street in Mexico, uh, they're much more understanding and realistic about the relationship. And they, 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 they're much more aware of how important the, 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 the dynamics between these two countries are. I, 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 th I think Mexicans across the board understand and welcome uh, uh, US uh, investment, uh, US companies. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a coincidence that, for example, a Walmart has the largest number of stores outside the United States in Mexico. Um, there's a huge, huge community of tastes, of interests, of engagement. Uh, but the beauty is that what we're seeing again across the border is that neither culture is, is, is dominating or sucking up the other. Me Mexicans will watch a uh, Hollywood film, but at the same time, uh, that night will arrive and switch on TV and watch the Mexican soap opera of the day. There, there is a great connectivity and synergy and, and, um, and uh, uh, a milieu that is taking place in, in Mexican society. So there, there's no reticence in terms of, oh, no, I won't take a job at that store or that company because it's an American company. Um, the issue of, of, of going abroad to study, I, I think most, if given a chance, given a scholarship, would... would would do it. In fact, education has been one of the most important drivers of how this relationship has been transformed. I, I, I was, I, I've been blessed by, by uh, having come to this country as a Fulbright Scholar and Ford Foundation Fellow, and um, I was at the embassy as a diplomatic tadpole when we were starting to negotiate NAFTA in 1993, and I still remember that one evening we invited a series of very important policy makers in Washington to to Mexico's cultural center on 16th Street. And Henry Kissinger was there. And I wasn't senior enough, obviously, to be sitting at the table. So I was standing at the back, making sure that the discussion and the dinner went well. And when the dinner is over, Henry Kissinger stands up and looks around, looks at me, and says, I can't believe. And there were several Mexican cabinet ministers uh, 
uh, with their American counterparts, with members of Congress, with businessmen, with policymakers discussing the relationship. And Kissinger sort of looks around, says, I can't believe what I've heard here today. It is so impressive to hear how Mexicans have changed their understanding of the United States. And I looked at him and said, Mr. Secretary, there's one very powerful answer, Fulbright. And I started pointing at the people around the table. It was Fulbright, 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 Fulbright. The power that education has had in both directions in enhancing understanding of what the other neighbor looks like, what it feels like, the importance that it has to our economic growth and well-being has dramatically changed the nature of the relationship. And I think that as we look at the relationship going forward, this is one of the issues that we need to put more attention to. How do we enhance the ability of students, of faculty, to do postgraduate work, to go across the border, to have high school students come for a summer abroad? This is one of the most important issues to, again, ensure what I was saying a few moments ago, how our two societies understand that they need to remain co-stakeholders to one another. Very interesting question. I mean, on the Mexican side of the border, is, are there demands that Mexico do more to uh, uh, keep bad people from coming north to south? Uh, I mean, doing more to close off its own border against security threats? Yeah, of course. There, 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 there are many who... I mean, have you actually thought about um, making us, uh, having some fun by building your own fence? <laughs> a, a, a former governor once said that, uh, you know, show me a 50-foot fence and I'll show you a 51-foot ladder. I don't think fences or walls are the solution to the types of challenges that we face. Um, if we were to suddenly decide that we're going to change the paradigm and that we want to prevent dr uh, weapons and cash from crossing over, we could certainly do it. But then that would mean that we would completely change the way we go about fighting drugs. And we would put all of our assets on our northern border with you to prevent guns and cash from coming in. But then, because we have limited resources and our armed forces are nowhere the size of your law enforcement agencies, we would have to stop looking after ports of entry either maritime or on our southern border to prevent drugs from coming into Mexican territory. But, so but, so there, there's, the, there's a cost to that shift in paradigm. No, I understand why you do it, but is there, is there a political uh, demand for it? Are the people calling for more security? I, I, think, I think there's enhanced um, concern and anger in Mexico as to the perceived failure of the United States to stem the flow of the guns and the cash. And increasingly, people are saying, well, you know, why don't we, instead of making sure the drugs don't come, come into Mexico on their way to the United States, why don't we spend all of our resources preventing guns and cash from coming into Mexico and, you know, let the Americans deal with the drugs and how they get in is their problem. I don't, I don't think that's the way to go. I, I've, I'm convinced that uh, uh, we've come a long way from the days where the Americans would wag their fingers at Mexico and say, oh, you're the springboard of all the drugs coming into the United States and we would, in a chest-thumping and evidently convenient way, retort, if we're the springboard, you're the swimming pool. I, I, think, I think that we've both understood that the paradigm that we have to develop together is one of joint responsibility. I, I, I must say, I can't get this idea that more guacamole was sold to <laughs> spring forth and ketchup. I'm, I know, it's a, I'm, I'm such a small thinker. Yeah, the, uh, here's a, a, an, an, another question that will test your, your diplomatic skills. Uh, President Lula has talked about the integration of Latin America and Latin America under Brazil's leadership. What's uh, Mexico's response to that? Well, I, th I think President Lula is, is free, to, uh, <laughs> free to say whatever he thinks is convenient for Brazilian interests. I, I, I would probably um, uh, uh, underscore that, that Mexico probably has a different geopolitical out outlook in the Americas than what Brazil has today. But I, I, th I think the issue of who leads is not the relevant one. I think the issue is who can provide for a fundamental debate into the issues that will make Latin America build upon a decade of growing prosperity and, um, and, and how we engage with what I think is, again, regard I may or may not like what I'm about to say, but what I think is an, 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 um, a, a uh, 
critical partner in the Americas, which is the United States. And I think that anyone who would seek to decouple, uh, strategically decouple the United States from the hemisphere would be committing a big mistake. Here's, a, here's another a really good question that's long. Uh, within the, func uh, it's, a, it's, it's a relevant question for us here because we deal with this a lot. But within the functions and limitations of, of the Mexican consulate in the United States, in your opinion, how or what would be the most effective ways to obtain the relevant and necessary documentation that a Mexican immigrant needs to have for a successful application to obtain legal residency in the U.S.? If the question is what, what do we... Well, Mex a Mexican immigrant right now, according to this question, is currently defined as uh, an illegal immigrant. I, I, don't, I don't think that's right. I think you can still get a visa and come here legally, but is there... You look badly confused here. Yeah, I, I, I thought I, it was a brilliant the, the, question. The, the, could, you, could you go through the question for me again? I'm going to hand it to you and you can read it. I mean, <laughs> Okay, uh, the, I'll, I'll sort of phrase the question, hopefully uh, having understood what the question is. The question is, what, do Mexican, what, what can Mexican consulates in the United States do to ensure that Mexicans who are here illegally uh, can obtain the proper documentation to be able to, to change their, stat, their immigrant status in the United States to legal status? Nothing. We, we, have, we have no attributions whatsoever in how a Mexican national obtains his documentation in the United States. The only thing that I would say is, again, that I think what, what we are about and what Mexico needs to do in the end game of how we take on immigration and the challenge of immigration is that Mexico needs to ensure that every single Mexican migrant that crosses the border into the United States does so, A, with papers, legally, B, and see through a designated port of entry. That's what we need to do as a country. Well, I uh, uh, was very enthusiastic about you coming, and I'm even more enthusiastic now thank that you, you have. And I want to thank the audience for the exceptional uh, questions, and I want to thank the ambassador for <laughs> answering them.